This is the anniversary of when Vitor Pletsky, one of the great heroes of World War II, staged his great escape from the camp to try and inform the world about the horrors taking place there. So I'd like to take your minds back to that moment when shortly after 6 p.m., April 26, 1943, Vitor Pletsky, prisoner number 4859, marched out of Auschwitz, Auschwitz gate knowing that if he ever returned, he would be a dead man. Here's an image that many of you know, it's his mugshot. For the past two and a half years, Pletsky had been on an underground mission to Auschwitz um, to infiltrate the camp by staging his own arrest in Warsaw, September 1940, to forge a resistance cell among the prisoners and crucially gather evidence of Nazi crimes. He arrived in Auschwitz at its beginning as a concentration camp for Polish nationals. Thus, he witnessed the steps by which the Nazis conceived of and built their death factory for Europe's Jews. Pilecki became the first person to alert the world to the camp's horrors through his smuggled reports. He was also the first to try and stop them. Three years before Allied commanders publicly acknowledged the camp's existence, Pilecki was calling on them to bomb it through his smuggled messages. And this is a, a little piece of our research. It's uh, the text of his plea to the Allies to attack Auschwitz. And yet, as we of course know, that word was not listened to. And here's a portrait that captures Vitold on the eve of his escape. This is an amazing picture because it was drawn by a fellow prisoner around about this time. And for me, it captures the heaviness with which Pilecki regarded that moment, that sense of weight of his mission on his shoulders. In spring 43, Pilecki had come to the stark conclusion that after two and a half years in the camp, dozens of messengers sent outside, he realized that he was gonna to need to escape the camp himself in order to rally a force to attack it. It was an incredibly dangerous mission. So far in 1942, there had been 170 breakout attempts, we believe, of which barely a dozen were successful. And of course, if Paletsky was caught, he'd either be shot on the spot or worse, brought back to the camp for interrogation. Suspected accomplices were likely then to be tortured, Paletsky's own family to be arrested. And even though he was under in the camp under an alias, Tomasz Serafinski, Pleski knew that someone in his organization might crack, indeed, he might crack under Nazi torture. But of course, Pleski also knew that spring of 1943, that the need to escape could not be greater. Because in the nearby camp of Birkenau, around two miles away from his barracks in the main camp, gas chambers were being constructed that would increase Birkenau's killing capacity to four and a half thousand people a day. This is an extraordinary photograph taken in that spring of 43, so showing prisoners constructing the new gas chambers that the Nazis hope would allow them to exterminate Europe's Jews. And here is a plan of those gas chambers that were drawn up in the SS architect's office beside the main gates. And uh, we have this image today because Paletsky's men stole this very copy that you're looking at now and managed to smuggle it out of the camp. Let's go back to that moment 76 years ago as Paletsky starts to leave the camp. It's evening as he walks under the main gate sees those iron letterings, Arbacht macht frei, silhouetted against the sky. Pletsky was with a group of prisoners assigned to the baking squad that supplied bread to the camp. That bakery was located about a mile from the camp along the Soa River. Here's a map of the area just to get, get you oriented. You can see um, the main camp and then the river 
flowing towards the northeast is the tannery building that Paletsky walked along, walked past, and he would have caught a glimpse something like this of Osvinchen. This is a wartime, wartime image before he reached the tannery. Now the civilian bakers ran the baking operation, but the prisoners were allowed to perform menial tasks, mixing flour, shaping loaves. Its location beyond the perimeter and the fact that the bakery ran a night shift made it the perfect situation to escape. There was one problem, however, a big one. The prisoners were locked in the building for the duration of their shift with two guards. The key was kept on the wall near where they, the guards sat. Furthermore, the daytime baking de details secured the door with a latch that could only be opened from the outside. Pletsky thought he had come up with a solution. He was arranging to escape with two other men who I'd like to introduce you to now through their mugshots, Jan Redze and Edward Cisielski. Redze had done something extraordinary. He had managed to steal the key briefly from the wall beside the guards and with a piece of dough make an imprint. He then taken it back to, uh, to the camp and they'd given it to a, a prisoner who worked in a metal, uh, metal workshop to forge a key. Redze had also discovered that that outside latch was secured by bolts, the nuts of which were accessible from inside the bakery. So that meant that they could actually unscrew them with the right spanner. And um, maybe we'll talk about this a bit more in the Q&A, but this is the spanner that they used to escape the camp. And it's uh, now, of course, in the exhibition in Berlin, but what an incredible artifact. So please have that in mind as I continue the story. Once they'd opened the door, um, Pletsky's idea was simply to make a dash for it. The idea was to head for a safe house in the hills outside Krakow some 60 odd miles away. Quite how they get there was not clear because the area around Auschwitz had been annexed to the Reich and colonized by German settlers. Anyone spotting them would immediately call the Gestapo. And even over the border in what was left of Polish territory, known as the government general, he had, Pilecki had no idea whether his fellow Poles would come to his aid after almost three years of brutal occupation. Pletsky marched out of the camp with the others, knowing that his fate and the fate of so many prisoners there rested on what happened in the next few hours. I'd like to pause there for a moment and just take you back to when I began research on the volunteer five years ago. And I knew I wanted to take a different approach to a conventional biography. In fact, I felt like I had to because unlock, unlike what we may, might call the famous characters of history, the George Washingtons or the Churchills, whose records are extensive and whose actions and sayings were memorialized at the time, Pletsky hardly featured in the record books and left so little trace, indeed, I only heard of him by chance. 10 years ago, I met up with a reporter friend of mine, Matt McAllister. We covered the wars together in Iraq and Afghanistan and were trying to make sense of what we'd witnessed. Um, I, for example, I got caught in a suicide bombing in Iraq whilst embedded with US troops. Um, here is a picture taken of the scene um, a few seconds after a suicide bomber drove into the tank you see to the right. I was in that tank um, and fortunately, the blast doors were closed just enough to send the force of the explosion away from those inside. Of course, many were still quite badly injured and a uh, ambush kicked off following that. Um, here's a shot um, of, you know, I took um, as a mortar landed nearby, sort of get a sense of that percussive force from the expression on the soldier's face and here I am in the bottom left during that ensuing gunfight. My friend Matt had traveled to Auschwitz and learned about a resistance cell in the camp and I remember just being stunned by that idea of resistance. How could anyone fight back 
against the Nazis in a place like that, I wondered. For me, and I think for, for lots of people, Auschwitz was the ultimate symbol of suffering and victimhood. A few years later, when Paletsky's 1945 report was finally translated into English, I got to discover the man who built that resistance cell, of course, Vitol Paletsky. And I was even more amazed by the account that I read, which seemed to offer a startling new way of seeing the camp, not through the eyes of a victor, victim, but through those of a protagonist. And this is that report, um, which um, yeah, I love looking at. You see that blue looping handwriting around the margin, margins. That's Paletsky's own handwriting, which he scribbled down, hurried edits. Um, he wrote the whole hundred odd page reports in uh, only a few weeks in the summer of 1945, before that report was then smuggled to London and stashed in this filing cabinet in a semi-detached house in West London, which became the repository of the Polish underground's missives and records. And actually, you can see that beige folder on the second shelf. That is Paletsky's report. And that's where it still sits today, not in uh, some archive in Warsaw, in, um, but uh, in, in a little West London semi for, for people to visit. Of course, I knew upon reading that report that I needed to find out more. And that was when I discovered the fact that so little had been written about him in English. Um, I managed to glean a little online that Paletsky had gone on to fight against the communists, take over of Poland at the end of World War II. He'd been captured, executed by the communist regime, and all trace of his wartime record either destroyed or locked away. And, you know, even talking about Paletsky could lead to arrest. Since the fall of communism, those archives in Poland have been opened and some incredible scholars like Adam Syrah have pieced together Paletsky's life. Um, but I felt like there were questions that I still wanted to explore, questions that Paletsky himself had dwelt upon but could never answer, like what happened to the intelligence he risked his life to smuggle out of Auschwitz? Why did the Allies ignore his pleas for action. And of course, the biggest one of all, how many lives might have been saved had the world listened? And I think I also felt personally challenged by his story. I was the same age as Paletsky had been at the start of World War II. I also had a wife, two kids and a home. What would make Paletsky risk everything on such a mission, I wondered. And what was it about his act of volunteering that spoke so powerfully to me? Five years ago, I set out to try and answer those questions and the deeper mystery of his motivation. I flew to Warsaw in January 2016 on my first reporting trip. I wanted to meet immediately Paletsky's son, Andre. Um, I was a little bit nervous ahead of the meeting after all, who was I to suddenly alight upon his father's story? Andre had been little more than a kid when his father was executed. Here's a picture I always find touching of Andre and his sister, Zofia. For 50 years, Andre had been told that his father was an enemy of the state. He only started to learn details of his father's mission in the 1990s when those communist archives were opened. Of course, I shouldn't have worried about meeting him because Andre was the most delightful, engaging man I could hope to meet. Although he did warn me at that first meeting, Jack, I'm not sure what else you'll find out about my father or where you should start looking. So I told Andre, with you, because when so little is known about your dad, anything that you might be able to tell me is going to be important. I felt that I couldn't recreate Paletsky's thoughts beyond what he had written and what people like Andre, who had known him, could tell me about his thinking. In addition to living witnesses, I knew I could also mine the over three and a half thousand prisoner testimonies held at the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum 
hundreds of which either touched on Paletsky's work or described events that he witnessed. Most of these testimonies have never been translated or published before. And this is one of my favorite rooms in the world, even though it's in Auschwitz. This is the research room where I got to meet so many great scholars like Sarah and um, Dr. Piotr Sakevich, the head of the research department. And in those uh, filing cabinets behind you are um, printed versions of many of the prisoner testimonies. There they all are hundreds and hundreds of voices from that terrible time that I knew I could mine to garnish details of what Paletsky had seen. And of course, there's also the archives themselves. And here is Marta and my other researcher, Katagina, looking over a really amazing document. This is by one of Paletsky's men. It's a camp diary that he kept um, inside the camp and smuggled out that uh, you can see today. I also wanted to follow in Paletsky's footsteps as much as possible. The war and its aftermath ravaged the country, but many sites remained where I could glean material, surviving features, terrain, and even when nothing remained, I felt like I could accomplish something else. I think it was the writer Vitold Gombrovich who said that we can only write a book after we've become convinced that we're the only person in the whole world who could write it. And approaching Paletsky, I knew there were going to be many like Andre who had known Paletsky more intimately than I ever could. Of course, there were great scholars of wartime Poland and of Auschwitz who spent their careers immersed in their subjects. I needed to persuade myself that I had something to add. I needed to find my own way into the story. And so one of the first things I wanted to do was recreate Paletsky's escape from the camp, which I knew was going to be one of the highlights of the book. And Paletsky describes the escape vividly, as does one of the escapers, Edward Cicielski, who wrote a memoir that captured new details and dialogue. So that allowed uh, my researcher, Marta, and I to piece together a lot of the scene in the bakery. Here's our sort of research map that um, allowed us to imagine what it was like in the bakery. Of course, we could only reconstruct this through the words of Cicielski and Paletsky, um, but they describe where the guard sat in the sort of middle of the room, the location of the bakery. We were also able to use their accounts to build up a rough map of their route from Auschwitz to the safe house outside the town of Novi Vizhenich. So here is a, um, uh, a map that shows that route skirting around the southern limits of Krakow and crossing between what was the, the Greater German Reich and the general government, which was Polish occupied territory, uh, German occupied territory. We were helped in our sleuthing work with, uh, by amateur historians like the Auschwitz Memento Group and the Historical Society of Bochnia, who had already discovered some of Paletsky's passage. Indeed, Googling around the theme of Paletsky and escape, I learned that a Polish rock band called Fortezza uh, had walked the route the year before more on them in a little bit. Um, but one of the great joys, I think, of working in Poland uh, was sharing in people's engagement with history, which was so much more passionate than anything I had known in the UK, because, of course, we had never had the experience of someone of our government trying to hide or take away that history. So I got the basic outline of the escape route. And the next step for me was to stage the escape itself. And it wasn't going to be enough to simply do it at the same time of year. I wanted to do it at the same day and the same hour. So that was why at around 1 a.m. on April 26th, 2016, I packed my bag. Here's a little inside look at the not so glamorous life of a author and researcher. 
and I met up with Marta at the site of the bakery. Now, the building itself no longer exists, um, but we found the precise spot and worked out the route of Paletsky's escape, which actually was straight past that McDonald's that you see there. So this is the scene that I'd like to take you back to. Paletsky, Redze, Chisielski have been in the bakery for over six hours working with bakers under the watchful eye of two guards who are locked in with them. Paletsky had wanted to escape after the first batch of loaves was in the oven, but it starts to rain and a German soldier and his girlfriend had come and sheltered under the eaves of the bakery, cutting off their escape. The couple had only moved on around midnight. Redze had used the time then to unscrew the nuts, attaching the latch and bolting the door. They'd stashed civilian clothes in the coal shed in the building, which they now collected. One of the guards had started to patrol up and down the building. So they only had a few moments as his back was turned and he walked away from the door for Pletsky to give them the signal. Now, Redze inserted the forged key into the lock and tried to turn it. And that was when nothing happened. He tried it again. It didn't work. Come on, lads, said Paletsky, and they put their shoulders into the door to try and force it, and it bent and then finally buckled under their weight, and they were free to sprint into the night. The guards shot after them, but they quickly disappeared into the darkness, and thus begins Paletsky's escape. Now, Paletsky describes how they dashed about 200 meters or so towards the Soa River that flows through Osvinchim. When Marta and I reached the bank, we faced the same dilemma as Paletsky. He needed to cross the river as quickly as possible to get beyond the camp environs. The main bridge into the town was, of course, far too dangerous. And so we stood there as Paletsky did and came up with the answer. Now, that noise you hear is a train crossing the railway bridge that links Auschwitz to Krakow. And this is, this is what it looks like during the day. And this was indeed the route of Paletsky's escape. And there's the Sower River. You see the castle of Svinchen in the background and the river flowing underfoot. So that night, Marta and I crossed over and I kept hearing the sound of that train and I think it's just worth pausing for a moment and thinking about how many transports of Jewish detainees cross that bridge on their way to Auschwitz, never to return. Perhaps Paletsky also shared that thought too. We don't know, but I certainly had that idea. Paletsky then describes jogging along the banks. Um, this is our not quite so stiff jog, as I think you'll agree. Um, we found wild garlic along the, along the way, which the prisoners used to secretly harvest around the camp, the food. I was also struck as I walked by the smell of almonds every now and again, which turned out to belong to a hagbury bush lining the river that's... Uh, are in full blossom in late April, and which you can see today. Um, here is a, a hagbury bush. And I met up with a, a botanist a few days later, Piotr uh, Gizegoretz, who helped us identify the hagbury and also shared with us this amazing folkloric story um, from uh, Poland's history about how maidens spurned uh, by their lovers would cut branches of hagbury flowers and put them beneath their beds to commit suicide because that almond smell came from the plant's naturally occurring cyanide deposits. And of course, that story really resonated with me because the Zyklon B pesticides that the SS used to gas, use in the gas chambers, also smelt of almonds. So we carried on 
until almost daybreak. And um, Palitsky doesn't give the precise location of where he crossed the Vistula, but he says it was just before dawn. And that allowed us to roughly pinpoint the spot on the banks where it would be just about here. And Palitsky describes then finding a boat chained up on the bank. One of the links was broken and it's one of those great sort of moments of miracle in his story when he sees that one of the links in the chain has been bolted together and that spanner, that spanner I showed you an image of before, they then used to um, un, uh, unscrew the bolt and free the boat to then make it across to the far side of the bank. And um, as they staggered up onto the open fields, the sun was just coming up and they knew that they had to as quickly as possible make it to that line of trees you see in the background there. And um, that's the, you know, the first place that they could rest. We know that area now, um, it's called Metkov Forest. And, um, and its owner was an ethnic German who was nonetheless sympathetic to the Polish underground. So towards that forest, they ran as the camp siren sounded announcing their escape. They finally reached the trees and deep inside the shadows, they could finally take a breath and embrace. And Pletsky reserves some of his finest writing for the moment because he describes how in that forest, he lay down on a bed of moss, something a little bit like that, and lay on his back looking up at the swaying pines. And he says this, looking at those trees, the pines whispered, gently waving their huge tops. Scraps of blue sky could be seen between the tree trunks. The dew shone like little jewels on the bushes and grass. In places, the sun's rays broke through, a silence far from the roar of humanity, far from men's scheming. A silence in which there was not a living soul. What a contrast with the camp in which I felt I had spent a thousand years. We were enchanted by everything. We were in love with the world, just not with its people. Palecki rested there in that forest during the day, and then at dusk, they set off again towards the hills, and those pine trees gave way to hornbeams and beech, this very forest that you see here. And then suddenly, Palecki encountered the ruins of the 13th century Lepoviets castle. Here it is today. And they slept or tried to in the dead leaves um, in one of the gullies near the castle. Um, I got to have an upgrade and stay in the castle myself. The next morning, they woke early and made for the nearby town of Elvernia, which stood near the border between the Polish territory annexed to Germany and the so-called general governments. And Paletsky made for a 17th century Bernardine monastery, hoping to find help. Here it is today. And to their great joy, they found the Polish priest inside who duly delivered to them food as they hid in the bushes. And he arranged a guide for them on their next leg of their journey. My experience was a little bit different because it turned out that the Auschwitz memento group, um, that group of local historians, had arranged a celebration of the escape for that day and invited Andre Palecki himself to attend a ceremon ceremonial riding of the cavalry of the Uhlans um, from Auschwitz to the monastery. And here's a little shot inside the monastery. Here is Andre inspecting the horses. Um, in the camp and here they come riding along. And here I am with Andre, uh, my researcher Louisa and Marta. Um, so as evening began to fell and Paletsky set off, I was in store for, again, a slightly different experience because that, um, that band I mentioned earlier, Fortetska, had staged a concert that night and here they are playing their particularly brilliant band of brand of rock music. 
and I spent the night with Andre in the monastery. Here we are going up to our rooms. And here is where I got to um, have a night talking to Andre, reflecting on his father's experience. And if I wondered how I could gain Andre's trust when we'd first met in Warsaw a few months before, I felt like I was beginning to earn it now. The next day we set off after Paletsky. So let me just go back to um, um, that map again. So if you can envision it now passing around the edge of Krakow um, through a number of villages, Tinets, um, various forests. Our usual approach was to stop in villages and ask to meet the oldest person in the community um, to find out what life was like under the occupation. And on one occasion, we got to meet two elderly sisters who actually remembered the arrival of three desperate prisoners at their door whom their parents had fed and sheltered. And contrary to Paletsky's worst fears, the Poles he met had not buckled under the Nazi occupation. They were still ready to risk their lives to help others. So the journey, Paletsky's journey, culminated in the town of Novi Vizhnyc, and here is an image of the castle above the town, over the hill that Paletsky would have crested. Paletsky sought out the head of the local underground, and he was in for a big shock. Paletsky had been in the camp, as I mentioned earlier, under the alias of one Thomas Serafinsky, a Polish officer who had fought in, the, in Warsaw during the German invasion and then left behind his ID for the underground to use after he'd returned home, his home being uh, um, in Novi Vizhnyc. And here it is, and turned out to be the very house that Paletsky was now approaching, the house of Thomas Serafinsky. And here is Paletsky with his two fellow escapers shortly after arriving in the house. And this is Thomas Serafinsky himself with his daughter, Maria. And this is what the house looks like today. I mean, the, the back door. And that little girl you saw a picture of just now, here she is, 70 odd years later, making me a cup of tea. There's Bogdan Bastil of the Auschwitz Memento Group, Stanislav Kobiela, who is um, a member of the Bokhnia Historical Society, who sadly passed away a year and a half ago. And here we are, of course. Toasting to Paletsky. I think as a biographer, you're always in pursuit of your quarry, as it were, hoping to catch a glimpse of the man or woman you're chasing after. And it was definitely a moment for me sitting at that table when I felt like I finally caught up with Paletsky. And here's a song that some of you will no doubt know. I'm just dwelling on this lovely song because it was one of Paletsky's favorites. Indeed, he learned how to play it, and Andre could remember his dad playing that song in the post war years before his arrest. 
this is the barn where Paletsky and the other escapers stayed and it's just in the grounds of the house here it is today and they would often sleep here if there was a uh, risk of a German patrol going by and that table where we were singing and toasting Paletsky earlier um, here it is again that was the table where Paletsky sat down to write his first history of Auschwitz, his first account of his extraordinary mission in Auschwitz. This is what he wrote at that table. And Pelesky tried to rally a force among the underground um, in the area to attack Auschwitz, but he realized he was gonna need more men. And so the autumn of 1943, he set off to Warsaw to try and rally headquarters to stage an attack. Here he is, me, I almost feel like he's about to leave on his new mission right there and then. Now Pilevsky went on to do many brave things. But for all of his subsequent feats, his desperate struggle against the Germans in the Warsaw Uprising, his stand against Poland's communists after the war, I find myself coming back to that mission to Auschwitz. And here's why. Because in that act of volunteering to be sent to the camp, Pilevsky set himself on a trajectory that was different to every other person sent to Auschwitz. He was there by choice. He chose to go to Auschwitz. He chose to form an underground cell. He chose to smuggle reports out of the camp. He chose to escape. Why is that act of choosing important? Because Pilevsky reminds us that empathizing with the suffering of those beyond our immediate family and friends is also a choice. As the fate of his reports show, it's not the instinctive reaction of many people to seek to come to the rescue of others, especially if they themselves are in danger or facing hardship. But just because it's not our instinctive reaction, it doesn't mean we are absolved from taking action. The Nazis were counting on the world turning away from their crimes. The survivor, Simon Wiesenthal, recounts being told by an SS guard upon arrival in one camp in 1944. However, this war may end. We have won the war against you. None of you will be left to bear witness. But even if someone were to survive, the world would not believe him. Pilevsky asks us, no matter how gruesome the subject, no matter how difficult our own circumstances, we never stop trying to understand the plight of others. This is a photograph taken of Pilevsky in late 1946. It's probably the last picture taken of him as a free man. He died following a brutal series of interrogations and a sham trial, believing he had failed to deliver his message. My hope is that in writing the book, The Volunteer, I can show that it wasn't Paletsky who failed. He succeeded in alerting the world. The failure to take action lies elsewhere. So for the past five years, I felt compelled to follow in Paletsky's footsteps. As a reporter, I've always been drawn to extremes and I found none greater than Paletsky's story of survival in Auschwitz. It describes the worst that we can do to each other. And surprisingly, some of the best. The Volunteer came out last summer and it's been translated into over 20 languages and forms the basis of the exhibition that's just opened in Berlin that I invite you all to go and see. I also got to find the name of a Jewish family that Paletsky rescued when he was in Warsaw in 1943. I'm in the process of applying to Yad Vashem for Paletsky to be recognized as one of the righteous among the nations. I've come to believe that Paletsky is one of the greatest heroes of the Second World War. 
And um, if you read the book, I know you will be inspired like I have been. So please help me in sharing Paletsky's remarkable story and in following in his footsteps. Thank you very much. Right, Jack. Um, thank you very much for what is, was a truly engaging and passionate narrative. Um, just as announced initially, um, um, now is the time for the Q&A session and um, we got the first questions coming in already. Um, so I will read them in the original language and um, they either be then translated or not, depending on which channel you chose. First question is by Anita Baranowska Koch. Czy natknął się pan na książkę Władysława Bartoszewskiego, który jako 18 latek został przewieziony tym samym transportem więźniu, jak Witold Pilecki do KL Auschwitz? I can't hear that question in English, so you might need to translate it also. Um, Basically, um, the question um, regards whether you heard of the book um, written by Władysław Bartoszewski, My Auschwitz, it's like the one one translation. And um, the question is uh, therefore in particular interesting since both Pilecki and Bartoszewski obviously have been colported, brought to Auschwitz in the same second wave of transports and deportations to Auschwitz. Sure, and, and Barzhevsky's testimony was just the sort of material that we needed in the making of the book. Um, we found perhaps about a dozen testimonies by prisoners who were on the same transport as Paletsky to Auschwitz, and that really allowed us to paint a picture. We had Paletsky's own account that gave us a sense of what of his thoughts and feelings, but then we could use the testimony of prisoners like Bartoszewski to describe whether it was raining or not, or you know some of the incidents that were going on that Paletsky himself didn't note, didn't record, but which we knew he would have witnessed because he was a prisoner in that group. Thank you very much. Next question, um, Steve Long. Were there any clues in his upbringing that he would become such a true hero? Um, well, for me, that was one of the really compelling elements of Paletsky's story, because I think, but for World War II, he was likely to have carried on in his life, um, which was a gentleman farmer of, you know, a relatively small estate in eastern Poland. He was married, he had two two kids he was a great sort of community organizer and um, i think there were no real signs that he was going to um, do anything um, beyond help his local community and so there was a gear shift that came with the german invasion and i describe it in the book because for me it's it's so fascinating how do people living seemingly ordinary lives have it within themselves to do something extraordinary. And that for me is very much, um, you know, Paletsky's story in a nutshell. Right. Um, the Q&A board is rich in praise for your presentation. I will okay. um, reveal the content of them later on to you. Um, for now, let's, um, uh, let's move on to the next question. John Cornell, um, during book tours, what has been the reaction to Paletsky's story in both Britain and the US? Uh, well, it's it's been amazing. I've um, I got sponsored by the Jewish Book Club in the United States to give over a dozen talks all over the country. And it's invariably the same. I get up to speak about Paletsky in front of a room of 100, 200 people. And sometimes, you know, I'll ask, how many of you heard of Paletsky? And no one raises their hands at all. And yet by the end of that talk, I have a queue of people coming up saying to me, I cannot believe I have not heard of this man. I feel badly that I didn't know his story, the story of the Polish underground. And um, it's become, you know, it's become this 
this great way to connect um, connect people together. Some of my favorite events have been those which have been co-hosted by Polish diaspora groups and Jewish groups. And often it would be the case that it would be the first time that these groups were coming together, um, sharing their stories. I mean, one time in Los Angeles, it was a talk at the American Jewish University and there were a couple of um, Jewish Auschwitz survivors there. There were a couple of uprisers in the room and they got up, they talked to, you know, talked to each other. They, I mean, I was almost irrelevant, <laughs> irrelevant to the proceedings. It was just having them come together and share their war experiences, which they hadn't done before. And of course, you know, this is Paletsky and that's what's so incredible about his story. He brought people together in a time when the Nazis were trying to break people apart, divide them into narrow ethnic groups and, you know, Paletsky managed to do it in the camp and I'm just delighted to see his story echoing, echoing that as I talk, go give talks around the, around the place. Fair enough. Um, next question is the sort of, I'd say, um, you could say diamond question among all gold questions. Um, Lucy Powers asks, can you speculate as to why no action was taken by the Allies when his report became known? I, I can indeed. Probably about half of my book is uh, my answer to that question. For me, you know, I, I knew Paletsky's story was incredible. And, you know, you know, what I needed to find out was what happened to those reports that he risked his life smuggling out of the camp. And no work had been done in this area before. Um, and it was one of the most goosebump inducing moments of the research when Marta called me up uh, one evening. She'd been in that West Ealing archive and she had found a report. And in that report, was a description of the passage of Pletsky's first message from the camp from Warsaw across occupied Europe all the way to the Polish government in exile in London. The reason it was goosebump inducing was it had Pletsky's own words in the report. Pletsky couldn't write anything down when he was in Auschwitz. He would have his messengers memorize his words precisely. That's why we know it was Pletsky speaking and to paraphrase what he had to say in, um, in his first message it was please for the love of god bomb this camp and um so powerful a moment so powerful to hear paletsky's words lost words um once again even over the over the phone and of course so historically important because when we think about bombing Auschwitz, we think about the debate in 1944 when Churchill and Roosevelt sort of were publicly acknowledging the camp's existence and thinking about whether or not to, to bomb it. Paletsky was calling on them to bomb it in 1940. So that really moves the clock back um, in terms of what the Allies knew, when they knew it, and, you know, I, and answers you know some of these questions much sooner as to why they did nothing so i, I would encourage lucy and and others to um to turn to the book because i trace all of pletsky's reports or as many as i could from the camp to london and try and describe their impact and um and, and offer some you know the reasons why the allies didn't respond sometimes they had good reasons sometimes they have reasons that i think uh, will make you furious um so mm. yeah Right. Um, next question is, um, let's say, somewhat embedded in a longer multifaceted narrative, but nonetheless, I think makes sense and is clear. I'm familiar with those. Yeah, <laughs> Plus, probably more so during live presentations outside. Um, Maria uh, Suchzitz asks, Jack, I have both read and reviewed your book and it is fantastic. Could you maybe elaborate a little on the others who were involved in Pilecki's network in the camp and how his smuggling of the important intelligence out of the camp depended on the help of others who also believed in his cause to notify the allies? 
Oh, that's such a great question. And um, whilst, of course, this is Palatsky's biography, he was not alone in the camp. He could not have done what he did without this extraordinary network. And, um, you know, both within the camp, men like Stanislav Dubois, Dubois uh, Vincenti Gavron, um, so many, Henrik Peremsky, um, there's this long, I mean, there was almost a thousand men by the summer of 1942. Um, I tell the story of many who um, Pletsky engaged with, who survived and got to share their, their memories in, um, in memoirs or in, in testimonies. But of course, there was this incredible network outside the camp um, that I think really is eye-opening for a lot of non-Poles. Um, you know, the Polish underground is not as well known as it should be. And, you know, I think that is one of my great hopes of the book is that, um, you know, a lot of people will complete, you know, reassess how they look at Poland during the war. I think most people don't even know there was a Polish underground outside of Poland, um, you know, despite the fact that it was the largest in Europe, despite the fact that over half of all intelligence from continental Europe came from the Polish underground to the Allies in, in London and Washington, D.C. You know, there's this, I mean, I, you know, many of your, of those here today will know why that is, which was, of course, the communist takeover of Poland at the end of the war, the Allies turning their back on Poland and this terrible, tragic forgetting of the heroism of men like Paletsky and those I describe in the camp um, and outside who worked with him. And it was just, it was just um, one of those moments I had again and again was meeting Polish families who had no idea what their parents or grandparents had done during the war. And it fell to me and Marta and Louisa and my researchers to say, did you know your dad, your granddad worked closely with Paletsky to smuggle out reports of the horrors of Auschwitz to inform the world? And they, they just had no idea. And um, yeah, so it's, it's time we all sort of woke up to the extraordinary contribution of the Polish underground excluding all of Poland that, of course, already knows about, about the role, its role. Right, thank you very much. Agnieszka Bojkowska, what, in your opinion, was the most shocking in the biography of the captain? What moved you the most? What moved me the most was a little extract I found in an archive um, that he wrote just before he was captured and it's not well known at all um, it was the introduction to this memoir he planned to write and it's a very short fragment it describes the camp and he's really struggling to evoke understand, comprehend what he witnessed there. And suddenly he hits upon this scene of sitting with friends in Auschwitz on the day before those friends were due to be executed. And he says that every one of those men had the same regret. And that was that they had not given more of themselves in their own lives and had not given more of their heart to those they loved. And, you know, knowing Paletsky's story, imagining him writing that in 1946, you know, not having seen his family for so many years, struggling to connect with them after the war, you know, that really resonated with me and of course resonated with my experience and my knowledge of soldiers emerging from war zones, you know, knowing how hard it is to connect with, with people, return back to sort of normal life, even though, of course, post-war Poland was anything but normal. So 
yeah, that 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 one extract is it's it's in the book quoted in full. It's it's very humbling and beautiful to read. Right. Um Lucy um uh, Ma Ma Marchin, I'm, I'm sorry for I'm probably I pronounced it wrongly. Um is there anyone else within history to which he is comparable? Or is his story one of its own? That's a good question. I mean, when we think of the great heroes of World War II, I think, you know, we tend to think about German war heroes, Klaus von Stauffenberg, who tried to kill Hitler, Oskar Schindler, who rescued Jews, um, from, um, you know, maybe a few figures of the French resistance, Churchill, you know, um, you know, for me, Pletsky is, you know, should be on the lips of everyone as one of those great heroes. And of course, for me, it's crazy that Oskar Schindler and Stauffenberg, both, you know, very reactionary German figures in the case of Schindler, you know, a war, Nazi war profiteer, you know, should be, should be lionized where here we have this man, this extraordinary man who, um, the most unblemished of records um, forgotten. So um, hopefully we can all rally around his um, his name and in getting him, you know, recognized as a as a great war war hero. Mm -hmm. I'll move on quickly because I think time constraints might soon um, start to horn on us. Um, Christina Franke. Did I understand it right that Pilecki is not yet honored in any way? How can that be? Well, uh, he is well honored in Poland and it's one of the most lovely experiences to sit with Andre or Sofia um, during our interviews or now just to sort of meet up and have tea and cake and their phone will be ringing and it's some school in Poland that's renaming itself the Vito Pilecki School or it's a road that's getting renamed or a, you know, whatever their statue being opened and they want Andre to come to, you know, inaugurate um, uh, at the ceremony. So for sure he is being recognized in Poland as, you know, as a great hero. And, you know, I think it's, you know, hopefully everyone who's heard this talk today, anyone who reads the book or comes across his name will, you know, share, share it because that's how, we will get him broader recognition, um, you know, in the in the outside world, as it were. Right. Imelda De Joya um, asks you, Jack, um, if you are intending to um, attempt any book tours in Warsaw at all. Well, <laughs> I had been planning a book tour <laughs> next month, but um, I think like everyone here today, uh, life has taken <laughs> an unexpected turn. Um, and um, so we, that got the publication of the Polish edition of The Volunteer um, has been put back until September. And, yeah. you know, hopefully then we'll get to do um, some events in in Poland. Um, mostly, I just want to you know bring together the, if at all possible, the the family and you know all those who helped contribute to the making of the book to thank them. Um, I don't know whether it will be possible, but um, at least we'll have a Polish version of of the book published in September. Right. Um, Bruno P. Suarez asks if there are any current plans for a movie to be made. So I'm really pleased to sort of announce somewhat um, that um, I got approached by a, an incredible um, film producer um, who is behind just some of the best movies of the last decade or so that have won Oscars, um, I think films like 12 Years a Slave, Slumdog Millionaire, Billy Elliot, um, and she is trying to um, make a make a movie. So um, we'll, you know, fingers crossed. It's not an easy thing, even though, of course, this is a story that just cries out to be told on the on the big screen. But you know, hopefully, hopefully we can make progress. Right. Um... One more question. Um, 
like uh, in many press releases, I guess, and also in some uh, reviews, um, it, it said um, those reviews said that um, one of the one of your intentions or motivations in turning towards Pilecki's story, exploring it, researching on it extensively, was to somehow, as it was put, make sense out of your shocking experiences and what you have been witnessing um, being a war correspondent both in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And um, the question arises, did this engagement with Pilecki actually serve its role and helped you to make some sense out of these experiences? Um, I, I, it, it did, because I think I left Iraq and Afghanistan very burnt out by my experiences there, you know, watching two societies collapse around you um, and um, watching many Iraqi and Afghan friends lose their lives or have their livelihoods destroyed was, you know, really, um, really tough. And I, you know, felt, you know, I went into journalism hoping that by sort of telling the truth, you could make make a difference. And, um, you know, that's pretty much the point at which I came across Paletsky's story, um, not feeling like I could do any more war reporting. And, you know, here then was a man who, you know, put himself in a level of danger that I could barely comprehend, who over two and a half years, day in, day out, risked his life, um, gathering evidence, uh, reporting, you know, in some ways, Paletsky was this extraordinary um, war reporter um, on what he, what he saw. And of course, he didn't, you know, he didn't give up. He kept on going right through the up uprising, right through uh, the communist takeover, you know, he kept, he held to his beliefs. And I found that hugely inspiring, I think, um, and really sort of re rekindled my desire to tell the truth and my desire in, in some way to listen, because I think what, of course, what's we can all take away from Paletsky's story is that, you know, here is a man of huge probity and courage, um, but who was not listened to. And, you know, I found myself looking, you know, around the, me in the world, the, the greater world, and wondering where are the Paletskys out there today? Are we listening to them? Are their voices being heard? Because for sure there are other men of great probity and courage out there. I mean, that's what is inspiring about his story it's not that Paletsky was some godlike figure of superhuman powers of endurance and he was a very special man for sure but he was also you know someone whose you know experience we can all read something of ourselves in and uh, you know i hope people who read the book will you know be inspired to be like Paletsky and reach out to others, listen to voices that um, they might not otherwise hear. Right. Um, the very last question, I think, um, um, which, is, uh, which I will read out loud now to you. Um, there's a question regarding the Auschwitz Museum. Um, like, um, in, in what way, um, like, um, how, how did the any potential cooperation with it go? Did it support you or quite on the contrary? Um, it has actually helped us a lot as the Pletsky Institute when composing our exhibition, but it's obviously a different thing when working on a book. Um, how, how would you comment, comment on that? How would you speak on that? Uh, well, I had, uh, my, I had two researchers who basically uprooted their lives and moved to Oswinchim um, within about quarter of a mile of the gates to the camp and who every day for those two years would go to the research department, that lovely green uh, desk that I showed you, and were basically camped out there. And they had so much support from the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum. Um, the research department head, Dr. Piotr Sekerovic, you know, one of the most knowledgeable men about Auschwitz, you know, sort of became our mentor, as it were, and helped guide us through the SS records, um, through 
Um, Adam Surah helped us with a lot of the testimonies and, you know, they were just with us all, you know, all along the way, reading various drafts, fielding all of our um, questions. And, you know, I felt, I felt very honored to be part of this, this community, which stretches back to 1946 and the first director of the museum, Kazimir Smolin, who began the work of gathering prisoner testimony and continued through successive directors, this just incredible undertaking, trying to record people's memories. And, you know, I got to make use of it and, um, you know, share some of those stories. Right, Jack. Um, I think um, this is now the time just to say a huge express our gratitude and a big thank you. Um, as I said, the reactions were and and too enthusiastic. Actually, I could say, and that's not, um, you know, that's not exaggerated. I will present present them to you later. And um, for all our audience, for all our attendees and participants, it's also a big thank you for, um, yeah, joining us to share this special day and this special event. Um, a couple of like, just two three announcements before we can say all say goodbye to each other. Um, you can follow both the Warsaw Central of the Pilecki Institute on Twitter, on Facebook, on its webpage. There's a lot of going, lot going on, lots to learn, um, lots to take lessons from. And the Pilecki Institute Berlin, which is its own branch, and it actually also operates its own profile, own webpage. You can find all of that. And there will be some more, um, I think, very, very promising events in due course. Um, April um, 29th, Roger Moorhouse will also deliver a presentation based on his book, First to Fight, Poland 1939. Um, on May the 5th, um, we're going to expand on our Exercising Modernity program, which is a special course um, exploring and reflecting upon the experience of modernity in the 20th century in Poland, in the European context, and there will be a debate on how to conserve modernism, and this somewhat paradoxical term, um, with Alexandra Kenjorek, Professor Martin Kolrausch, and my colleague Małgorzata Jędrzejczyk. Um, May the 7th, we're going to have, to have a special um, Zoom conference, The Forgotten Ally, um, with a truly, you could say, star lineup. Marcus Meckel, Alexandra Ritchie, the author of the famous book on the Warsaw up Uprising, and also author of one of the more important books on Berlin, Professor Johan Böhler and Dr. Jacek Munarczyk. And um, last but not least, May um, the 14th, a um, Zoom seminar on the trail of Otto Wächter about post war justice and memory with Philip Sands. Um, yes, also quite well known figure, author of a very popular BBC podcast on the history of the Second World War. Uh, and of course, we hope um, that we can all invite you to come to Berlin and see our exhibition. Currently, it is somewhat suffering due to loneliness, not at all due to its own misgivings, but current conditions are what they are. It is what it is, but this is soon going to change. And we all hope, uh, we hope to see you all there. Um, for now, um, thanks a lot again. Hopefully you'll be with us again, join our profile channel meetings and Zoom special offer. Thanks, Jack, a lot. This was great. And um, have a lovely evening altogether. Thanks, Patrick. Bye for now.